Hello and welcome to Just One More Watch. Welcome to another watch boxing head-to-head deathmatch special. Now, I've been looking forward to making this one ever since the idea popped into my head about six weeks ago. I took delivery of the Tissot PR100 from Joma Shop, I opened the box, I peeled off the dial sticker and I thought, damn, this looks a lot like the Seiko Saab 033. I think I even mentioned it in the unboxing video that I intended to put the two of them head to head. So this one has been a bit of an inevitability. They've been glaring at each other from opposite ends of the studio for the last couple of weeks. Now these are both my watches, but there's only room in my collection for one of them. Which one, I wonder? Let's flip the camera and get on with it. So I suppose you could consider this one to be an upscale version of the video that I made a couple of weeks ago where I put the Seiko SNKL23 head to head against the Cadison C1032 to determine which one was the best everyday watch under 100 US dollars. Both of these watches are significantly more expensive, the Tissot just under 300, the Saab around the $400 mark, but I think you get a lot more watch for your money commensurate with that extra spend. I think either of these watches, both of these watches would be great, versatile, do everything, go anywhere, all day, every day pieces. If you're considering picking up one of these for your collection, even just a one watch collection, then both of them should definitely be on your shopping list. But which one is the winner? 10 rounds today, but two of them are double weighted. That will give us a total score of 120, which I will conveniently convert into a percentage for you. Now, some of these categories may mean more to you than others. You can adjust your own scores accordingly, but these are my scores because this is my channel. So I'll start as always with movement, double weighted category at the top. That should hopefully add a bit of context as well. Now I may end up talking about these movements for a little longer than usual today. I think both of them, apart from anything else, they're quite interesting movements. However, there are question marks about the long-term uh, durability, viability, serviceability, longevity of both of these movements that I think you should be aware of if you are considering picking up either of these two watches. So what are the scores then? Now the on paper scores, the theoretical scores, if you get a good one, I think the Seiko Saab, the 6R15 in there is worth 6 out of 10, giving it a double weighted 12. The Tissot PR100, the Paramatic 80 in here, fantastic movement, one of the best you can get for the price, 8 out of 10, giving it double weighted 16. So this is the Seiko 6R15 movement in the back of the Saab. 23 joule hacking and hand winding automatic. It winds in both directions. It is a three hertz movement. So it vibrates 21,600 times per hour, leading to six ticks of the second hand per second. Now it is not the bottom rung of the Seiko ladder by any means. It features the magic lever system. It features some of their other goodies and it features a not inconsiderable 50 hour power reserve. So more than two days of power reserve is fairly significant. You can take this one off on a Friday night, pop it back on your wrist on a Sunday night in anticipation of the office the next day and it should still be ticking away nicely. Having said that, it's not the most attractive movement in the world to look at. There is a little bit of bling there on that rotor, but the rest of the movement is pretty basic. Should be able to regulate it though without too much difficulty if it requires it at some point in the future, it regulates in the normal manner just with a little lever there. But I did say that there were question marks about the 6R15. Uh, my friend had a dodgy one, I got sent a dodgy one. I've heard reports of plenty of other dodgy ones. I guess they've sold a bunch of these, that is not unreasonable. But C-type balance issues seems to be the general complaint. Low amplitude beat error and happening uh, not after five or 10 years, but only after about 18 months or so of use, which is a bit disappointing. Seiko will charge you a pretty penny. They certainly charged me a pretty penny. When I got one serviced, they probably just junked it and put a new one in. So don't expect a discount on servicing because you're buying one of these as opposed to the Swiss made movement in the other one. Now, 400 US dollars, not an insignificant cost on a watch. There are plenty of watches with ETA 2824s, Solita 200s and the like at that price point. So a uh, three hertz, Japanese made Seiko movement that doesn't look all that attractive is only getting a 6 out of 10 today. So in the back of the Tissot we have the Powermatic 80, that's what they call it when it's in the Tissot and the Certina certainly. To be honest, not that much more attractive than the Seiko, if at all. 
Again, custom rotor and a little bit of decoration on one of the plates, but pretty, pretty basic. You don't get Geneva striping at this price, I'm afraid. What you do get though is an outstanding 80 hour power reserve. This is a slowed down ETA 2824 using a number of synthetic parts. They managed to increase the efficiency of the movement and by slowing down the beat rate to a similar 21,600 vibrations per hour, they stretch that power reserve out to 80 hours, which is truly remarkable for a watch at this price. And this one is COSC certified. That means the accuracy is guaranteed out the box to be minus four seconds per day to plus six seconds per day. I've tested it and it's true to the claim. So on paper, this one is an absolute belter. You really won't get a lot better in a watch for less than $300. However, again, there are question marks about this one. It cannot be user serviced or regulated nearly as easily as the base model ETA 2824 which forms the base caliber for this one. There's apparently a couple of screws, it's quite complicated, you probably don't wanna try it yourself unless you're an expert. And again, there's a question mark about the durability of some of the synthetic parts. So really, you're taking this one back to the swatch group, which isn't gonna be cheap if something goes wrong outside of the warranty period. Again, they'll probably just junk it and replace it with a new one. But on paper at least, that power reserve, the fact that it's cost certified and Swiss made under 300 bucks, eight out of 10. Now, I normally talk about the price, the value a little later on, but because there is quite a big difference between these two, I thought I would move it up towards the top today, again, helping to contextualize everything that follows. Now, the Seiko Saab gets a fairly strong seven out of 10. However, the Tissot PR100 gets a pretty spectacular nine out of 10. So uh, for a watch that was discontinued now over a year ago, they're still readily available, these Seiko Sarbs, and it seems the bubble hasn't quite burst on them. They're still worth more than they were before they were discontinued, but as you can see here, 399 on amazon.com. I will of course leave a link to that one in the description of the video. That is not a bad price. Previously, they were about 320. They boomed, they peaked up to closer to 500. They've dropped back down to 400. I think that makes a strong case for itself at $400, the Seiko Saab. So it gets a seven out of 10 for value. Now I got my Tissot PR100 from Joma Shop. They're currently charging 299 US dollars, less discount, that takes it down to 279 US dollars, less than 280 bucks. And I think you're getting an awful lot of watch. Swiss made, decent brand, fantastic movement, nine out of 10. There really aren't that many watches that offer more for less than the Tissot PR100, hence the strong score in this category. Next, it's Crystal. This one isn't gonna to take too long, to be honest. Seven out of 10 for the dead flat sapphire crystal with no anti-reflective coating on the Saab. Eight out of 10 for the dead flat sapphire crystal with anti-reflective coating on the PR100. Moving on to bracelet. Now, I'm sure there are a few Saab owners guffawing here when they see that their watch has actually scored more points than the Tissot. The Saab bracelet getting a seven today. The one in the Tissot, not quite so nice. It gets a six. It's not often that Seiko wins the bracelet category, is it? Let's be honest and it's sort of winning it by default today. The links are okay, the brushing is quite good, a consistent brushing on the top, high polish on the side. As you can see, I've been beating this one mercilessly, as is my want since I got it. And we've got safety pushers and a proper milled clasp at least, and we do have solid end links in there as well. But it loses three points, and I can show you exactly where it loses those three points. Pretty much no attempt to integrate the bracelet with the watch itself. It doesn't look like the bracelet was designed for the watch. Perhaps it was, perhaps it wasn't. Only two micro adjusts. That's not good enough considering the size of those links. And I hear early models are different, but in these late model SARMs, there's a bloody big gap there. Not great at all. So it may win, but it's a bit of a hollow victory. Seven out of 10. The Tissot does okay in terms of bracelet. It gets a six. We've got a nice mixture of satinized brushing and high polish on those mid links. And for once, this does look like it was designed with a watch. Very, very nicely integrated between those lugs as well. However, it falls short in a couple of areas. The clasp is all right. Bags of micro adjustment and security pushers. Tissot T stamped in there as well, but it's a dirty, dirty press clasp 
for $300. That is a bit of a disappointment. And I say it every time, you'll be reminded of the corner that Tissot cut when you put this watch on or off every day. And it's a little bit kind of rattly, squeaky, doesn't quite feel as high a quality as the Saab one. So it gets a six. Now, loom, one of my favorite categories. Sometimes there's a loom bonus. However, I think loom deserves its own 10 point score today. If this is an everyday watch, then loom does add a chunk of after dark versatility. And Seiko's Lumi Bright on the Saab, you can't really beat that at this price. Eight out of 10, bit of a disappointment on the Tissot, only scoring four in this category. So the Loom, this is 20 minutes compressed into 30 seconds. My camera is not as sensitive as the human eye. This gives a kind of real world five, six hours. It gives you an idea of how long these Looms last. As you can see, bright green from Seiko's Lumi Bright on the left and a pale blue BGW9 from the Tissot on the right. Only the hands loomed on the Tissot though, nothing on the dial, and it doesn't last as long as the Seiko, which is a bit of a disappointment. They kind of undercook the dial and they undercook the loom on the dial on the Tissot. Five down, five to go, and how are we looking? Well, after taking an early lead due to that fantastic movement and amazing price, half decent crystal, uh, the Tissot has lost a couple of points relative to the Saab because the bracelet isn't quite as good and the loom is nowhere near as good. Where do we go when we discuss dial, etc.? I didn't leave myself enough space to write dial and hands. Well, again, the Tissot loses even more ground to the Saab. The Saab scores an outstanding nine. The Tissot, a deeply middle of the road five. The Saab really is a very, very attractive watch. Now, I spent a bit of time with the 035, which is the cream dial version. This one, the black, although technically it's actually brown. When you catch it in direct sunlight, occasionally it looks brown, revealing its true colors. I didn't think the cream dial one was as attractive as this black one. It really is gorgeous to look at, especially when you get it in just the right angle. It is quite stunning. Clearly a Seiko, lots of Seiko DNA running through it. Applied Seiko logo. I quite like the automatic 23 jewel layer printer above the six. Applied indices, very nice handset. We've got a needle second hand. You can even thread the needle as a hole in the counterbalance. Attractive Dauphine hands with a center ridge, that loom that we saw earlier on as well. Attractive indices, plenty of different facets to them, but they're not too fussy. Frame around the date complication, and it's a color match date wheel as well. Again, you can't really complain about that at the price. One complaint I have is that the minute markers around the outside, that's okay, but the fifth of a minute markers are a little bit excessive on a watch that is essentially a kind of everyday watch or a dress watch. I think the dial would look cleaner if it perhaps was a little bit cleaner on that minute track. They just had the minute markers and not all those other little markers as well. But really, that's my only complaint. It is a very attractive watch and one that I'm sure you would still be very pleased to glance down at to check the time after a number of years of use. The Tissot, on the other hand, goes some way to redefining plain. We have a printed dial, no applied logo or anything on this one. We do have a sunburst effect like we had on the Saab, but that's pretty much it. Applied indices, but they are as basic as it is possible to get. At least the minute track is cleaner on the Tissot than on the Seiko. A little bit too much printing. I mean, Tissot 1853, no problem there, but PR100 chronometer officially certified. I would have cut the officially certified if I was able to. And what on earth is going on with that internal Cyclops? A circular Cyclops with a rectangular window there. I just don't get it. There is a bit of interest in the handset, mixture of different finishes, and we've got the T counterbalance, they're gonna kind of signature Tissot T counterbalance the second hand, but they don't make up for that plain Jane dial, five out of 10 for the PR100. And it's another strong showing from the Seiko when we discuss case finishing. It also scores nine for that category as well. Tissot not too bad this time getting a six, but still losing ground. Similarly, the case and case finishing on the Saab deserve their nine out of 10 and no mistake. Have a look at that side profile, beautiful curves and plenty of interest there. Smooth bezel, but it tucks back into the case. You've got a couple of different layers and a very well integrated, if slightly protruding case back. 
and the actual finishing is great. Very fine brushing on those upper lugs. Nicely machined there, and that super smooth, very creamy to the touch, Zeratsu high polish on the side of the case as well. Deserving its 9 out of 10. There aren't too many watches for 400 US dollars. Finished better than the Seiko Sarb. Now, don't get me wrong, the Tissot is okay. 6 out of 10, maybe I'm being slightly rough on it today, but against the Saab, it's just not as interesting as the Saab in terms of the case finishing or a number of other features, to be honest. Nice brushing though, very fine brushing. We do have a little chamfered high polish on the lugs, matching the high polish on the bezel. The overall case profile is pretty sweet. It's just not as interesting. There hasn't been as much attention put into it. There's not as much detailing as is evident in the Seiko. The actual standard of brushing on the lugs and on the side of the case is nice, as is the high polish on the bezel and the chamfered edge, but it's not as rich to the touch or to the eye as the Zeratsu polish on the Seiko, hence the 6. So if this is your daily driver, right, if this is the watch that you're going to wear the majority of the time, you want it to wear very well, and thankfully both of these watches do, but which wears better than the other? Well, perhaps a surprise. The Saab wears very nicely indeed, it gets a 7, but the PR100 is just outstandingly comfortable getting a 9. Now, the Saab does wear well. 135 grams is a great weight, not insignificant. It doesn't feel overly light or flimsy. Nicely balanced across the all stainless bracelet, that milled clasp, I'm sure, adding a little bit of weight to the bottom. 38 and a half mil. Now that's gonna to be too small for some, but it is just about perfect for me. Great as an everyday size as well. Now I tend to wear the Saab a little bit looser, a little bit lower down the wrist as well. Super smooth case profile, nice bit of curve there. Seikos, they really do cases very well indeed. You will never hear someone with a Seiko complaining about sharp angles and jutting crowns, etc. All very nice, very, very easy to wear as an all-day, everyday watch, this one. But it doesn't do as well as the Tiso today. The case is a little bit thicker, so it doesn't slide under the cuff quite as well. And I moaned about that bracelet. That does have the potential to catch on things. So it wears very well, but it gets a 7 today. But the Tiso wears oh so sweetly to score its 9. Pretty much an identical weight, 135 grams. Perhaps a little bit more in the head and a little bit less in the bracelet, but nonetheless super smooth. Slips under a cuff, it's a millimetre slimmer than the Seiko. And again, gorgeous shape, gorgeous case profile, easy to wear lower down the wrist. Nice small crown doesn't dig in, super comfortable this one. 9 out of 10, a real surprise this Tissot. If you're going to get an everyday watch, you want it to wear well, and this one certainly does. Not long to go now, two categories left, but one of them is double weighted, that being brand. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Whether you like it or not, brand is important. Having a good brand on your wrist, uh, something you can be proud of wearing, something with a bit of history, with a bit of a reputation behind it. And I think that brand becomes more important the more money you spend on a watch. Once you get past the no-namers, the Chinese specials, and you're spending three, four hundred dollars on a watch, it's nice to have a little bit of cachet, a little bit of recognition on your wrist. That's why I'm going to give the brand score today to Tissot and not Seiko. Now Seiko are fantastic as a company. They've been in business, they can trace their lineage all the way back to the 1880s. Now still fully in-house, that's a Seiko movement in a Seiko case, Seiko bracelet, etc, etc. And they have a long and proud history of innovation. But they're a little bit every man. For $100, there's pretty much nothing better than a Seiko on your wrist. Once you're pushing up to two, three, and four hundred dollars, though, I think the Swiss are giving them some serious competition in terms of cachet, which is why Tissot gets just that extra little point today. 1853, it's all over the box, it's all over the dial. Tissot can trace its history back to 1853 as a company, outscoring Seiko by close to 30 years. They have been part of the Swatch Group now since 1983. Now, they are one of the lower rungs on that Swatch Group ladder, but for me, there's just a little bit more about having Swiss made on your dial and being on that Swatch Group ladder than is offered by Seiko at this price point, which is why the Tissot scores an 8, the Seiko are still pretty strong, let's be honest, seven. And last but not least, it's 
X Factor. Now, some people accuse me of putting this one in just to skew the competition the way I see fit. But as discussed earlier on, this is my channel, my rules, my scoring system. I can pretty much do what I like. I do think it is important though, you know, this is all very good talking about the objective, the quality of the movement, the stats, the specs, etc. But once you get to these two last categories, they're a little bit more subjective brand and that X factor, that extra little je ne sais quoi, the little bit of mystique that these watches either do or don't have. And for me, the Saab has it the Tissot simply doesn't, I'm afraid. The fact that the Saab has been discontinued, again, just adds a little bit of something to the magic. And the dial and hands on that watch, when it catches the right light, oh, there aren't too many watches that look that good for that amount of money. Now, if a fellow watch guy or watch girl spots that watch on your wrist, they're more likely to be impressed by the Seiko, to be honest, than by the phenomenal technical specifications and value offered by the Tissot. The Tissot is very plain Jane. It's a little bit dull, if I'm being honest. Incredibly sensible. It's probably the watch that Colin from Accounts buys, Unless, of course, he's already bought himself a Saab, but it just doesn't have the magic that the Saab has, so it only gets a four for X Factor, as opposed to the Saab's eight. So where does that leave us then today? The big reveal, the totals and the percentages. Well, 88 out of 120 for the Seiko, 83 out of 120 for the Tissot. That gives the Saab 73%, and the Tissot PR 169%. Not an awful lot of difference between them on paper. I have to admit, I was very surprised when I totted up these scores. I thought the Saab would absolutely romp this competition today. But it doesn't, it just doesn't. It's much, much closer when you tot up these scores than I had anticipated anyway. And obviously it's easy to see where. That movement is fantastic, the value is incredible, it scores slightly better on the crystal, and it wears magnificently. I think Tissot as a brand is very, very strong, giving it overall a great score. Like I said, right back at the beginning, you would not be disappointed if you bought one of these as a long-term proposition. It is super, super sensible, providing you don't run into issues with that movement, but I can't score for that today. Providing you get a good one, this watch is an excellent package overall. Really outstanding value for money, super sensible, discreet, everyday wear but it doesn't quite have that magic that the Seiko Saab has. At 400 US dollars, I think this one is becoming good value once more, hence the seven. No real weaknesses here. I mean, pretty strong, consistent scores across the board. Movement is nothing special for the price. Like I said, for $400, there's plenty of Swiss movements around there, which I would rather have than the 6R15. Again, given the slightly checkered history of this movement. But one of these watches will be staying in my collection. The other one will probably be on eBay by the time you watch this video. The Saab is the one for me. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.